Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, um, the effects of salvation, what we have been saved unto. You know, we have been saved from something unto something else. And uh, I'm going to do this in three Sundays. So um, I, I believe that, well, come, come all three, otherwise get the CDs, you know, and, and, and listen to it. <clears throat> I want to just read uh, something just to open the service up and then pray. This is one of my favorites, you guys know it well. It says, My people are hell-bent on leaving me. They pray to God, bow for help. He doesn't lift a finger to help them. But how can I give up on you, Ephraim? How can I turn you loose, Israel? How can I leave you to be ruined like Adma, devastated like luckless Zeboam? I can't bear to even think such thoughts. Just think of God here. Here God comes, He says, to people that are hell-bent on leaving Him. These are people that say, well, you know, God's been good to them. It's like Ezekiel 16, where God came and He, he, and, and he sp spoke about Israel. And you know what's a nice thing about the Jews in Israel? They're a very stubborn people. A very, I mean, I mean they're full of pride, they're stubborn, they don't want to listen. And God chose them to show the whole world how He will love people. And every time they would mess up and every time God would be good to them. To show the whole world how He loves people. Amen. God is not a sin conscious God. He's not a, a judgment conscious God. He's not there to condemn you. He's not there to judge you on the basis of what you do for Him. The gospel is the message of what God has done for you. How God has set you free. How God has given you peace. Amen. The gospel is about, and I, I mean, I've, I've, there's a little bit of controversy and, and things on, uh, on the web about this, where I said, what I, about what I said last Sunday, I said, God didn't call us to serve Him. He came to this earth to serve us. Now, that doesn't make us higher than God, okay? Because in the kingdom of God, the one who is the greatest servant is the greatest, so he came to serve us with no condemnation. He came to serve us with um, freedom from bondage. He came to serve us by giving us righteousness for free, giving us peace for free. Amen. So here he comes and he says, um, uh, uh, My people are hell-bent on leaving me. And then he says here, How can I leave you to be ruined? So, you are stout to mean someone. Verstaan jy, hulle wil nie luister nie. Dit is in Hoosia, hier is die message so, dit is omtrend so hier rond. Elf. <laughs> Elf something. <laughs> so, Elf vers 6, 7, 8 haar rond. Hoosia 11. So, so I say, how can I leave you? He says, I cannot bear to even think such thoughts. You know, the other day, <clears throat> two days ago, I was watching the, uh, uh, the Christian channel and there was a, a, a guy in America <clears throat> that was getting money to get people, children, that's on the streets that are sold for, sold for sex slaves. You know, then they've got these hidden cameras showing how these children, how people trade with these kids, you know, kids of, of six years old, eight years old, ten years old, how they sell these kids for sex. And, and um, you know, when I, th when I th was looking at that, and then I think they worked out it's like $128 to get one of those kids off the street, you know, with, uh, uh, with parents that will care for them in a proper way. Because they'll, get, they'll have to go and rent the child, you know, because how they, they can't just come and get the child. They'll have to pay the, the pimp or the whatever, get the child, and then run off with it, w with a kid, you know. So that kind of thing. And then there's a house where they keep them safe, and then they... Um, get parents that's willing to adopt them. So these children, when, when you think of that and you think of your own children and if that must happen to your daughter or your son, you know, away from the parents, put on drugs, that being done, what happens to your inside? Your, your inside, man, you cannot bear to even think such a thought. When that comes, you don't think, well, you know, um, he didn't clean the garden last week, so 
Um, well, well, I've got three boys here. This one, th this one gets 80%, that one gets 70, and this one gets 50. So, well, the one with 50, it's not that bad if they do it to him. You see, the moment that happens, if, if we think of such extreme things, what a person does is not brought into consideration. Because what happens to him is tampering with his value. And I want to tell you that God, when, when He looks at man, when He looks at you, He says, how can I ever leave you? I cannot bear to even think such a thought. He cannot bear to even think such a thought. Um, so that we can be, leave you just so that you can be devastated. He says, my inside turned in protest. <clears throat> and so I am not going to act in my anger. I am not going to destroy Ephraim. And why? Because I am God and not a human. So God says, I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to punish. Because I am God and not a human. You know, so many times I found in my life that, um, say you've done something wrong. And I, if I think when I was in school, you know, I struggled with homework. You know, I mean, I've worked at school now. So why must I not work at home? You know? <laughs> I don't want to do homework. So, but then I, I didn't do my homework and you come to school and then the teacher is there and that teacher is going to judge you. I would rather stand before the judgment seat of God than before that teacher. If you stole money from, your, from a business that you work for, you would rather want to stand before God in judgment than stand before the, 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 uh, the board of that company. Because with the board of that company, you're not going to find mercy. But with God, you find mercy because His judgment will be a judgment that gives you life and freedom. That's what David said. He says, I'd rather be judged by God than by people. Amen. For God is not a human. God is not a human. We cannot put God in the category of a human being in the sense of He will act like what my boss would act. He would act like the government. Or he will act like the police. He would act like my school teacher. No, no. God's number one vision is to show mercy, to show kindness, and to set you free by Him loving you. Isn't that awesome? Let's pray together. And uh, we're going to read from, from verse 16, and then we're going to... Well, just, just show me when I've preached about 30 minutes, Aubrey. Okay. Um, and then this, we, we're going to do this over three weeks. Okay, so uh, I'm going to explain to you what happens to a, to a person when he believes the message of grace. The message of no condemnation, but the message of unconditional love and grace. What happens with us? When we became part of the law and judgment and condemnation, when you were standing under what I must do for God and not what God has done for me, sin manifested in our life. And in the same way, when we stand under grace, good works will manifest in our life. But, <clears throat> so many times in the church, uh, good works was the qualification for God's blessing. Now it's difficult to preach about good works in the grace circles because the moment you talk about good works, then people think, well, you know, the guy wants to put me under the law again. You know, so in this next three weeks, I'm going to talk about how do we see good works manifesting in our life? How do we see um, freedom from bondage manifesting in our life effortlessly? I want to say this again. I say it every time. You guys are welcome. Come in. Um, I, I want to say this again. If change does not come effortless, it will not be lasting change. If change is not effortless, it will not be lasting change. Okay. So, so many times when you read the Bible, you think, well, I'm going to read the Bible and this, I must now do what the Bible says. And if I do what the Bible says and I change my life, then God will smile over my life. That's not true. The truth is God smiles over your life. God's not going to smile over you when you do everything right. God smiles over you right now. God smiled over the human race 
when Jesus was born because Jesus was your representative and that's what we're going to talk about right let's get into Romans 5 from verse 16 um, sorry <clears throat> verse, verse 14 nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come so here it says it's difficult English but what it says is that Adam was a type and a shadow of Jesus so if you look at Adam then he is a figure of Jesus so if you look at Adam you look at the power that he had and what he stood for it's a picture of Jesus so if Adam could make a decision on behalf of everybody it points to Jesus that could make a decision on behalf of everybody okay right but not as the offense so also is the free gift for if through the offense of one many be dead much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man Jesus Christ has abounded unto many so what does he say there he says well let me read the next three verses it will just be clear and not as it was by the one that sinned so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification for if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men um, to condemnation even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life those are very important words verse 19 which is the key verse for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous okay so what does he say here he says Adam was a type and a shadow of Jesus what Adam came to do pointed to what Christ is doing for us Adam was supposed to make the right decision he made the wrong decision on behalf of everybody Adam sinned when Adam sinned you became a sinner okay so when Adam sinned he, he placed all of mankind into sin you are not a sinner because you smoke you're not a sinner because you lust after somebody of the opposite sex or the same sex that's not what makes you a sinner Adam's disobedience made you a sinner and that dumped the whole world into frustration where they could not get free from sin they could not get free from bondage they could not get free from this me myself and I all the time they could not get free from it doesn't matter how hard they tried they could not get free from it uh, you can go to church and they can read the law to you and you can try your five steps on, ha on, on, on resisting sin with your willpower you will not be free because Adam came and he dumped mankind into something that mankind could not be set free from by his own power it was impossible and the thing he dumped us into had an effect in your life sin is not just defined as doing wrong things sin was def is defined as believing the wrong thing the word sin uh, um, means not to take part in to miss the mark not to take part in so in other words if I if my child let me give you a good example if he is seven years of age he's supposed to go to school if he doesn't go to school he's not taking part in school and that is seen by the government as an offense it's seen as sin because he's not taking part in what is his in the same way God came and gave Adam eternal life he came to give him everything for free but Adam chose not to take part in what God freely gave him and that was sin that had consequences the consequences of that was it it brought forth death in man okay now a little bit more technical verse 19 and 21 then the Bible says then God gave the law the Ten Commandments so that we can sin more 
Let's read it. Romans 5. This can be a little bit of a brain stretcher. If you're here for the first time, maybe, or second time, third time, this might be a little bit radical. But listen to what it says here. Moreover, verse 20, the law entered that the offense might abound. The law entered that sin might become more sinful. So what happens? The law came in so that people could sin more. That was the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was not to get you to live a holy life. The purpose of the law was to get you to see your inability so that you can sin even more. That was the purpose of the law. Let's read it again. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Like I said before, if you want a child that's perfectly obedient, that does nothing wrong, to do something wrong, you tell him, you see that bowl on top of the cupboard? You never look into that bowl. You never look into that bowl. You will find the obedient child that was maybe full of himself because he's always obedient. I see suitste van alle kinders. You will find sin coming up in his heart. If he doesn't look into the ball, you will find that he wants to look into the ball. And he's lusting after <laughs> looking into that, which is the same as doing it. Okay, so if you want sin in somebody's life, if somebody thinks that he's perfect righteous, give him a good law. A nice strong law. What will happen? You'll find he will sin. So God came, what Adam did was, Adam came and he says, I'll be righteous before God because of my own works. And then there were people that lived a fairly good life. Then God said, these people are deceived. They think because it goes well with them. They think because it goes good in their business. They think because they live well with the people around them and in peace with everybody that they are righteous with the righteousness of God. So let me give them a law that will bring forth and manifest their sin so that they can see that they in themselves are not righteous. So the purpose of the law was the manifestation of sin. Now, when Adam lived under grace, in other words, when he was in the Garden of Eden, believe, you know, walking with God in the cool of the day before he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he lived a good life. That good life he lived was powered and fueled by God. It was a life of peace, it was a life of joy, it was an effortless life, a life that was a fruit of something inside him. When the law came, sin abounded in the lives of people. Now we come with the gospel of grace. We tell people that God does not look at your works anymore. He fulfilled the law so that we don't have to live by the law anymore, but by faith in Jesus. Now, if He fulfilled the law, that we don't have to live by the law anymore, in the same moment we are also saved from all the consequences of the law, which is all these sin manifestations. We've been saved from it. It's not we stopping sin anymore. It is sin leaving us. You see, the, 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 the judgment system in the church preaches it this way. It says, God is holy and you are over here. God's standard is this. You need to live up to God's standard. The grace message says this. God's standard is over here. The law points out that you are over here. But grace says this, I give you my righteousness as a free gift. The moment you believe that, you are delivered from the disqualification of the law and its effect in your life. Amen. And its effect in your life. So where you've always been struggling with, say, racism. Or you've always been struggling with um, uh, covetousness. 
Ek soek net meer, ek soek net, you've always been struggling with that, and to the point that you are even justifying what you are doing, the Bible clearly states that we are justified by believing in Jesus. What that means is, we are set free from this thing that keeps us in bondage by what Christ has done effortlessly. So, what Adam did was, he dumped mankind into judgment into condemnation, into, into uh, 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 um, the manifestation of death in your life. Adam did it. If you take a child, young child today, without him believing in Jesus, you'll find it's natural for him to sin. You don't have to give him five lessons in to do something wrong. He will do it by himself. If you give him more rules, you'll find he becomes more guilty. Okay? That's the way it is. It, it's just natural. But the moment he believes, the moment that child can believe in what Christ has done, you find that all the sin leaves him. He doesn't decide to leave his sin. When I, when I received Jesus the first time, when I was in Standard 9, I was just a, 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 a young guy living a, a, a rough life. When I received the Lord, I didn't decide to stop to swear. I didn't decide to stop to drink. I didn't decide to stop to, to be disobedient or anything. I didn't decide that. I found a new life in me. God is not there to modify your life. God is there to give you a new life. A modified life comes by your willpower. Well, I'm like this. I'm going to use my willpower to modify that life. No, no. We are not to modify our old life. We are to receive His life. Adam gave us a life. That life is the life of death. Under that we received the law, plus the manifestation of sins by the law. So, you know, I've, I, I remember for years I've been thinking that, well, Jesus, you died for me, you give me the power to obey the law. God never gives anybody the power to obey the law. God gave us the power to live without the law. By His Holy Spirit that gives us a new life. You don't have to teach a dog how to bark. He barks by himself. Amen. I see we got a new little Jack Russell. You know, if you take a ball and you throw it in front of a Jack Russell, the Jack Russell fetches the ball. Now I've got a bull there. You throw the ball. He shows no interest at all. He doesn't do that. That burbles, best thing, the best thing he can do is do nothing. <laughs> that thing just lies there in the dust. That's what he does. Until tonight, and if he hears something at the gate, he does his job. He just makes a big noise. And that's enough. You know? That's what he's there for. But the Jack Russell is not like that. You just throw the ball past him and nature kicks in. So he cannot stop himself. He cannot help himself. He will chase that. You know, like the Jack Russell we've got, he'll take the ball. If we don't want to throw it, he'll throw it himself and catch it and throw it and catch it and throw it and catch it. <laughs> That's what he does. And when he's tired of doing that, he feels hot, he goes into the uh, little pond we've got there and then he'll swim there. Until he rests and then he's going to do the, the thing over again. Now you cannot teach him not to do that. He, that that is... He, He's bred to be like that. If he sees something run, a dove or anything, he catches it. It's his nature. In the same way, when Adam sinned, something became our nature. Our nature was to live a life of destruction. To live a life of, um, we are only, it's all about me. It's all about what I do. It is a life that manifests sins. Okay, that came by nature. So for God to come and give you a set of rules to tell you to stop that would be as insane as trying to teach the Jack Russell five lessons in how to stop to chase doves. He cannot stop. You can beat him, you can shout at him, you can do everything possibly that you know good, he will continue to do that because it's part of his being. He was born that way. The only way for that dog to be set free is if he could be born 
again from a different breed isn't it if you understand what I'm saying if you would take a, a, another dog which is much more uh, uh, timid and, would, would, and, and he could be born from a different father, you find that that dog will have a different nature. You see, what we do is not just of what we've been taught. It is mostly out of design, nature. So God came to give a new nature so that it would, would be as easy to live holy as what it was to live a life of sin. So I want to tell you, we've been preaching on grace so much, and I'm never going to stop preaching on grace. I just want to put the focus on this. I've got good news for you. We have been redeemed from the law and its consequences. We've been placed under a system where God's nature takes over and lives in us. So it's not about what I must do for God. It's about what God has done for me and in me. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's just read it again. It says, moreover the Lord, verse, verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. When Adam sinned, you became a sinner. Here it says, through one man's disobedience, you became a sinner and its effects. Now it says, through the obedience of one man, Jesus, you became righteous. Free from your contribution. He did it for you. Now the Bible says, the just shall live by faith. So he came and he made us all righteous so that those every person that's been made righteous which is the human race if they can believe this they will have life born in them from the reality of what Christ has done for them now I can't emphasize this enough imagine you work at a company and your boss steals money and you are found guilty for what he's done you will say that is unfair I didn't do anything wrong his disobedience his evil conduct brought destruction on my life now that is what Adam did and because God is a righteous God is a just God he's a fair God in Afrikaans sê ons, God is a rechtvaardige God. It would not be right if one man can dump you into that and one man cannot get you out of it. So Jesus Christ came and He obeyed on your behalf. It is as good as what your boss in the company, while you were doing wrong things in the company, he did something good and the company went up on the stock market and you benefited from that through his ingenious ideas you benefit you think hallelujah man I'm so happy I did nothing I was actually doing something wrong but because he did something right I'm blessed in the same way I want to tell you God has blessed you in Christ and set you free from the power of sins so you when Adam sinned, he brought you into... Now, I want to just define sin there. I, I, I want to talk it, uh, name it this way. A destructive life. A life, a manifestation of a life that destroys you, that destroys relationships. Okay? A life where you... Where, 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 like Paul said, Paulus said, Alles is my geoorloof, maar alles is nie stichtend nie. I can do all things, Paul says. I can do anything. I can eat food offered to idols. He can commit adultery. He can do all these wrong things. But Jesus has paid for that sin and that's okay. But then Paul says, all things are not beneficial for me. So what I want to say is, Jesus has redeemed us 
from a life that is not beneficial for you. So that you can have this new life free from your contribution through efforts, but simply by believing what is done for you. Amen. Right, so, verse, uh, uh, verse chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> Just look at the power of the gospel here. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So, let's read uh, uh, chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 19, uh, verse 20 says, The law was given so that sin could even become more. Now he says, Where sin became more, grace became even more. Now let me explain that. He says, let me use this as an example. Here is man. Here is man. God came and he gave the law. Okay? In written format. This made people, when they lived under the law, it made them sin even more. Okay? Now, he says, where sin abounded, Grace abounded even more. Waar die sonde meer geword het, het die genade nog meer geword. <coughs> okay? So what it means is, where we did not believe in grace, where we did not obey God by believing that He's given us everything for free, and the sin, sin manifested under the law, grace had a greater power to manifest the life of God in you than what the law has to manifest sin in you. That's what he's saying there. Okay, now he says, when you were under the, the law was added so that the sin can become even more. Now he goes in chapter 6, he says, shall we continue to sin so that grace can become even more? Now where does grace become more? The Bible says, when we live under the law, Sin become more and grace even more. Shall we continue in the place where sin become more and grace become even more? No. What does that mean? We shall not judge ourselves by living under works righteousness, but we shall judge ourselves by what Jesus Christ has done. <clears throat> Let me just, uh, uh, for those of you that are here that don't know this, <clears throat> I want to just explain why God became a human being. It will make more sense. When Adam sinned, he was a human. And he was a representative of the human race. So when he disobeyed, he did it on behalf of the human race. So the only way God could make a decision on behalf of the human race was if he could have a representative representing the whole human race. So Adam already died. And then the Bible says, then Jesus came, which is called the last Adam. So God came into human flesh, God the Father, that's where the Spirit of Jesus comes from. The flesh of Jesus comes from Mary. Okay, God was born into human flesh, representing the human race. Because He was a human being, He could decide for human beings. And when he decided for, when he lived as a human being, he was fully obedient to the law. He was fully righteous, fully holy, living under the law, having faith in God. And when he obeyed, he was 100% obedient for every man. When he was obedient on behalf of every man, every man received righteousness as a free gift. When we receive righteousness as a free gift, what happens to our hearts? What happens to our lives? What happens to our lives is the following. We can stop our effort to be righteous now. We can believe we are righteous because He obeyed on our behalf. What effort did we make to believe that we were sinners? No effort. We accepted it. And we did that because of Adam. Adam. Now, how much more can we not accept that we've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus? Ons is gerechtvaardig dier die bloed van Christus. Eens en vir altyd, volgens die beurs 10 vers 14. Once for all, we've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. Die beurs 10 vers 14. So, when, when we accept that, what do we accept? We accept 
that we qualify before God. When we accept that qualification and believe in what is done, we stop our effort to be holy before God, which came by the Ten Commandments and rules and regulations, which manifested sins in our life. And by simply accepting what is done and who we are, we are also set free from the power of the manifestation of sins. Hallelujah. So the moment that happens, you find you don't try not to stress. You find that stress has left you. Because you can identify with what Christ has done. So Romans 6 verse 1, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Now, that word forbid, um, I don't know what is the Afrikaans said. Iemand Afrikaans daar so, 6 vers 2. Hebreus, ach, Romeine 6 vers 2. Somebody there with an Afrikaans Bible there. Nobody. Okay, God forbid. Yes. Die die Afrikaans. Net gauw ek kijk wat sê daar. Ok, hy sê, in Afrikaans sê, nie stellig nie. Sal ons nie sonde blij, dat die genade meer kan word? Nie stellig nie. Will we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. But now, what I like with the, what the English says, he says, God forbid. The word forbid means to stop or to see something to exist. Now that is much more powerful than our human effort. He says, shall we continue in the place where the law when we live under the law, that is sin. The, listen, it is sin to think you can be righteous by your works. That's the greatest sin there is. There's no greater sin than thinking you can be holy before God by your works. There's no greater sin. So when we are in that sin of thinking we can be righteous by our works, more sins will manifest in us. Now it says here, shall we continue in all these sins that grace may abound. He says, no. When God came with His grace, God forbids this sin in your life. It is not you forbidding it. It is God forbidding it. Forbid means to cease to exist, to stop. So He says, and this is what I want to preach to you today. You know, for so many years, you might have been struggling with certain things in your life that you want to be set free from. But you can't be set free. You try, but you can't. It's almost like a diet, you know. <laughs> a diet work must not for a rookie. <laughs> Until you think you are on the right weight now. Glory to God. And then I can go and be who I am. And then you pick up weight again. Because you believe you are one thing, then you use human effort to be something else, but you always return to what you believe you are. That's the thing. So if you can, if we, let, let's use just the diet. If you can in your being believe that you're skinny. If, if that can be your persuasion, if you can believe in the very depths of your being that you're a certain kind of a person, you will have to use effort to be something else. Amen. You know, I've, in, 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 and I don't say this with pride, please don't, many people can think this is a pride thing, it's not. <clears throat> Since I've been in school, I knew I would not be able to work for a boss. It would be very difficult. I'd rather suffer having no money, but I can't work for a boss. It's not because I don't want... I mean, I was in the army. Okay, there you get a real boss. Okay, I went through it and it was a nice time. But, I really, I wish more, more people, young people can go to the army. Not for war, but just for what we went through there. It was a good thing. In a way, I had a nice time there. It was awesome. I don't want it over, but it was good, okay? But after that, I, I couldn't work for a boss. I just, what was in my mind was, I'll have a ministry, I'll preach the gospel. That's what I'm going to do. It's in me. I, believe, I believed in my heart that I'm a preacher. 
with a ministry going all over the world preaching the gospel. That's what I believe. When I was in ministry and I didn't have money, I did business. And while I was doing business, I would do it for a time and, you know, some of the business I did went well. You know, made money. If I continued with that business, I think I might have been very rich now. God gave me wonderful ideas and everything. But as I was doing that, I found that I always returned to what I believed about myself. When I was doing business, and they asked me, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. But you work 12 hours of the day. Painting houses and sandblasting and welding and whatever. Doing all those things. And you say you're a preacher. He says, what I believed in my heart, that, that belief brings forth, manifests that thing. Okay? So in the very same way, uh, um, when it comes to Romans here, he says, God forbids sin in our life when we can believe the truth about our life. And what we believe about our life was that Jesus has set us free from the bondage of corruption. I'm not talking about corruption in government. I'm talking about a, a, a destructive life. He has set us free. So when we say, and this is, this is such a powerful, powerful verse. He says, shall we continue in the manifestations of the flesh now that we are under grace? No. God forbids this. God ceases this thing to exist. So I want to tell you, you can stop your effort of trying to get sin to stop in your life. It is God's job. It's God's work. And He did the work completely. Amen. It was not your work, listen, it was not by your work that you became a sinner. Adam sinned and you became a sinner. And then you had sins because of what he did. In the same way, Jesus brought forth righteousness for us all. And what robs us from a holy life is our unbelief in who we really are and what is done for the human race. Hallelujah. When we believe this, we are saved from the consequences of what Adam has done. Having peace in this world. I want to tell you, the Bible says, we are justified by faith. Nou, is different between justification and righteousness. Het verschil tussen gerechtigheid en om gerechtvaardig te wees. En ek wil het gauw verduidelik. To be justified, uh, uh, to be righteous means to have the right unto. Afrikaans gerechtig. I am righteous. Ek, het gere, ek is gerechtig uh, uh, om my car te rui waar al is. I can drive that car out there. It's my car. It's paid off. It's, written, it's, it's registered in my name. I've got a legal driver's license. I've got the full righteousness to drive that car. I've got the right. Nothing can stop me. I've got the right. Okay? Now, if I want to drive somewhere, it is just for me to do it. It would be unjust if somebody wants to stop me from doing it. If somebody says, no, 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 you're not allowed to leave the building here. You're not allowed to drive with your car. That's unjust. It's unfair. Because I qualify. So I qualify for a life of freedom, where I can drive where I want, um, any time of the day or night. Okay. In the same way, Jesus qualified you to have freedom from the manifestation of sins. He qualified you. It's not you trying to stop it now. You are qualified. Now the Bible says by faith we are justified. Meaning, when I believe this, then the right thing that's supposed to happen to me will happen. Meaning, I will be free from all these manifestations of the old life in my life by the power of God resisting the evil in my life through what is done in Christ. 
Okay, now that's a, it sounds very complicated, but I want to tell you, this is so powerful. We have not just been saved b uh, f from something, we've been saved unto something. We've been saved from living a life by the law, and the consequences and effects of that life, unto a life where we can believe what Christ has done for us, and the effects and consequences of that in my life. And the consequences and the effects of that is peace in this life, effortless. The consequences of that is a new life that looks like the life of Jesus. So what I'm trying to say is, you don't have to try and copy Jesus anymore. You can be born from God. Amen. It's not you trying to copy Jesus. It's not you trying to resist sins. It's not you trying to stop to sin. That's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity is all about believing what Jesus has done and then having, believing what is done and Him living in you. Now, if you, there are many verses we will talk on next Sunday, but Paul came and he told the Christians of that time, how can you be set free from the law and its effects and still live as if you are under the law? He says, don't you know what you are saved unto? So it's not you trying to copy that. It's you accepting your new life. Amen. When you were in Adam, you just had to accept what has happened. That's it. And we've accepted that easily. But we have not accepted. And many times we don't accept what Christ has done for us. Amen. And what the consequences or the effect of that is in our life. Right, let's just read on. A little bit more. He says, For if we have been planted together, verse 5, If we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. So He became a human being. He, w when He walked on the earth, God saw you in Jesus. It was as if you were walking. You obey, he obeyed on your behalf. He died on your behalf. Okay, so when you die, when Jesus died, God saw you dying. What death did you die? Died the death of a man trying to be righteous by his works. Okay, <clears throat> if we were planted in the likeness of, the of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. Now let me explain that. He says, <clears throat> and I'm going to end off with that. When Jesus died, the body of sin died. When Jesus died, the body of sin died. I said it last time, you know, uh, uh, at our school, many schools here, they've got a governing body. That governing body decides for the whole school. Companies, They've got a governing body with directors and whatever. That governing body decides for the school. Now, if that governing body rules in a certain way, I mean, if they are in unity about a certain thing, it would be impossible for you as an individual to make a decision for the whole company or for the school if you disagree with them. But, so in other words, if they decided, if they make a decision, a bad decision, let's take Zimbabwe for instance, they've got a governing body making a decision for the whole nation. That body can be called the body of death. Okay? The only way Zimbabwe can be saved from that is if this body dissolves or dies. It's the only way they can be saved. Now the Bible says here that when Jesus died, the body of sin died. The, 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 uh, uh, um, the, the, the ruling body deciding, making sin manifest in your life died. It died. It has died. It's not for you to try to stop the sin. It's for you to get out of your own belief about what Christ has done and about who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Amen. He removed the law. He removed the curse. He removed disease. He removed the power of sin in your life where you do the things you don't want to do. And the things you want to do, you can You always want to spend some time with your kids, but you can never do it. You always want to spend more quality time with your wife. You know it's the good thing, but you can't do it. It's just impossible. Why do you want to do something, but you can't? That's a curse, man. That's not the life of freedom. Jesus came and removed that. So that you can love who you really are. Let me just give you a good example. You guys know, those of you that's been here last time, my, my in-laws came and, and visited me now for 10 days. Don't laugh. <laughs> me and my wife. It was wonderful, awesome. So when they came, I mean, I enjoyed fellowship with them. I loved them. But before that, I was in America for a month. When I came back, I had to take a break. I was overworked. Okay? Then they came. So now the stack of emails at home is really becoming thick. You know? And all the things that's wrong on the website that people write and say, listen, what about this, what about this, what about this? It's a lot. And this thing is bothering me. I want to do it. But I want to, in my heart, okay, I want to do that. I want to get that sorted out. But I know that my in-laws, they don't come often. And I want to spend time with them. I want to take them everywhere in Cape Town and fellowship with them. But now there's one law on the one side. There's one thing of, if I don't fix these things on the website, then I'm going to lose people that look at my ministry. You know, And this thing is a public thing where everybody looks at it. And if I don't fix this, which is true, it is true. If I don't fix it up, I can lose so, so, some uh, uh, followers, if you want to call it that way. It's like a business. You're going to lose some money. Okay, now, but here's my in-laws. I want to spend time with them. That's in my heart, but I can't do it. Why? Because this other law is telling me to do this. But what, I, what was the wonderful thing about grace is I could follow what was in my heart and say, I'll fix that next week. I'll fix it next week. I could start to think of, in the light of eternity, what does this one week make any difference? Because I started to have an eternal mindset. I started to think out of who I am. I knew it's not my right decision this week that prospers me. I've got a God in heaven that removed poverty from me. Hallelujah. And I could do what I wanted to do and spend time with them. Hallelujah. I could take my kids to the sea. And I can do it because I have been set free. I have been set free. I don't have to live the life of destruction anymore. I can live a free life. You know? We've got such a wrong mindset. You know, it's like the one guy, um, <clears throat> he was catching fish in, on the Mozambique, that Vilanculos, you know? Catching fish in Mozambique, beautiful place. And then this rich uh, um, businessman from Johannesburg came and he said to the guy, Man, I see you know how to catch fish, you know, because he was trying to catch, he doesn't get anything. And this local there is just catching one after the other one. He says, Now, how many fish do you catch here in a day? He says, Well, I catch about four. He says, Now, um, can't you catch a hundred? He says, Yeah, I can. Easily. I know how to do it, I know where the fish is. He says, man, but why don't you do, why don't you catch a hundred? And then he says, now, and the guy says, and then? What then? He says, no, 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 then you can sell, if you only eat four, then you can sell the 96 and then get more money. He says, and then? He says, no, no, then you can pay other people to catch fish, you know, and then you can make more money. He says, and then? He says, no, no, no then this can become a very big company. You know? He says, okay, and, and then he says, no, then you can buy these fishing trawlers. And then you can really catch fish. 
He says, okay, and then he says, no, then it can become so big that you can put this whole thing on the stock market and get investors, and then it can grow even bigger. He says, and then? He says, then you can one day retire. He says, and then? He says, then you can buy a little place next to the ocean and go and catch fish. <laughs> you see, we've been indoctrinated by so many laws and rules we, by, which defines our joy that we cannot have joy today. But Jesus has set us free from that. And our provision is in His hand. He will give you the right decision at the right time to make in your business and you will prosper. I believe that with all my heart. Without you stressing and fretting all the time about it. He has set you free from a life of destruction. He has set you free from that life. I've had so, how many people have I had? I, I can't count. Come to me and say, Bertie, but you live a nice life. He says, somebody bought you a house. You know? If you want to go somewhere, somebody fills up your tank. If you want to go on a holiday, somebody will bless you. You know, it's like, you live a nice life. And then you see the whole world. You know? You've, you go to Canada, you go to America, you've been to Italy, you're preaching everywhere. And everybody celebrates you, treats you like some celebrity. Because when you come there, you are the man of God. Isn't that a nice life? I mean, yes, it is. It is a nice life. I mean, you can also have that. Just leave your job and start to preach. <laughs> but there was a time in my life, and I, everybody cannot be a preacher, but this is what I want to say. There was a time in my life where I realized I was so set free from the law that defines my success and defines who I am that I could go and live who I really am by believing I'm a preacher that loves preaching to the lost, that wants to see people that's never heard the gospel to hear the gospel. And I could follow my heart because God has enabled us to follow our heart, who we are. Maybe you're a businessman and you just want to, you want to do business and, and whatever. If that's who you are, if maybe you feel like my mom said, you know, she says she loves working for a boss. She's a school teacher for 35 years or something. I mean, and she's good at what she does. And she enjoys it with all her heart, you know. But that's what's in her heart. She's not intimidated by a person that cannot work for a boss. Because grace has set me free from the definition of the law. So that I can be who I really am. Who you really are is a person that loves others. Who you really are is a person that's got compassion on other people. Who you really are, you are generous. Who you really are, you're somebody that loves spending quality time with others. Who you really are, you've been set free from outbursts of wrath and anger and all those things. You are free from that. That's who you really are. And we don't awake unto a new life on how we try to change. We awake unto the life where God has changed everything for us. And by accepting this truth, we find the Holy Spirit manifesting the new life in us. And I end off with this. When we accept this, we cannot accept it as merely a theory. This is not philosophy. This is not a, 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 a psychology. This is the truth. The truth is that one man obeyed on your behalf and delivered the human race from the manifestation of the flesh in their lives. They de God delivered the human race. So that God, where He stands today, is not angry with anybody. God did not send the tsunami to, to Japan to teach the Japanese people something. 30,000 people died. Now if you did, what did you learn? And how are you going to apply the truth you've learned now? God is not a murderer. God is, God loves people. He cares for people. When He looks at you, He agapes you. The word agape means to lose your breath in adoration. 
when God looks at you there where you sit busy even doing your wrong things he he loses his breath in adoration over you for you valuable to him amen that's how God feels and he acted on the basis of your worth and he brought forth a new way of life where you can be set free from all the things that always irritated you and have a new life amen not copying the life of Jesus but having the life of Jesus in you hallelujah next week we're gonna continue speaking on this because Paul, is, Paul says things like um, uh, 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 don't do this do this don't live like this live like this and that is that sounds like laws and condemnation if you go and read Ephesians, if you go and read Galatians, he will say, you know, you shouldn't do this, you should do this. You shouldn't commit adultery. Sin shouldn't be named among you. He, he says all those things. And that has been used by the church to condemn people. Now we're going to talk about that in the next two weeks. So make sure you get a hold of that, if you can understand this. But if you, what you can take home with you today is, you've been saved from the law and manifesting its death into you unto the life of Christ and the Holy Spirit manifesting it in you the Bible says the power that the law had to manifest sin is, is immeasurably smaller than the power of grace to manifest the life of God in you hallelujah that word immeasurable there or the, or the word is uh, the, the, the words how much more um, Francois Latour uses this this illustration he says if you go to Hermanus and you take a, a sink bot you know so like a sink bot that you can koop a the corporatie and you put a stone in it and you put some sand in it you put some seaweed in it and you put some grass in it Ach, I mean water sea water in it and you want to now compare the ocean with this it cannot be compared it's above comparison that's the Greek word there how much more will grace not bring forth the life of God? Unfortunately, in church, the life of God was preached as a law and was not preached as something that God gives and lives in you. Hallelujah. So be set free from condemnation and have an expectation of your true inheritance. We've inherited the new life in Christ. And that's true for every person. Amen. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you that you love us. I want to thank you that you care for us. I want to thank you, Lord, that as I preached here today, I know many things have been said and some things can be complicated, but thank you, Lord, that the people can grab a hold of your message of love. That you've loved us to the point that you've set us free from the flesh and its death. We reign in this life with you. Thank you, Lord, that you've qualified us so that we can reign in Jesus and in the manifestation of your new life. Thank you, Lord, that we are holy. Thank you, Lord, that we are righteous. And this is not our doing, but your doing. Father, I pray for everybody here. I thank you in this week to come that you, you, you give them wisdom and understanding in how to make good decisions you make the decisions in them for them in their hearts you prompt them in their spirit thank you lord i declare everybody here blessed by jesus loved by jesus cared for by jesus thank you lord that we know we've got a god that that lost his breath over us while we were sinners and you don't judge us according to our works but you gave your works unto us for free. We accept this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Thank you so much. If there's anybody that needs any prayer, you're welcome. I'll pray for you. There's some coffee.